Welcome back. This is chapter 8 on transcription, part B, pertaining to eukaryotic transcription mechanisms. Students should do really well if they follow two pieces of advice. One is to constantly compare and contrast the processes that are discussed in eukaryotes with the bacteria and archaea. And the second thing is to make sure that you do not overlap concepts by getting confused because there's a lot of similarity between the different mechanisms that will be discussed in this section. The most profound difference lies in the presence of intervening sequences known as introns, which are regions of a gene which do not appear in most cases in the final messenger RNA. Both the introns and the exons of a gene do appear in the pre-messenger RNA. The other important fact is that the proteins associated with DNA in eukaryotes are different to those that we find in prokaryotes. Chromatin is the name given to the entity of the DNA of the chromosomes plus the associated proteins. The chemical nature of these proteins and DNA can influence and does influence the activation of different regions of genes and chromosomes. Yet another profound and striking difference that's evolved is whereas in prokaryotes there's just one RNA polymerase for copying genes into RNA, in eukaryotes so far we have discovered three RNA polymerases. Each one has a role sometimes overlapping in transcribing different types of genes. So far RNA polymerase 1 transcribes several ribosomal RNA genes important for making RNA involved in ribosome structure. The most common type of RNA polymerase is that found in the nucleus transcribing protein coding genes as well as some small nuclear RNAs. The third class is RNA polymerase 3 which also has a dual function mainly to do with tRNA gene transcription but also a few other types of RNA especially one involved in ribosomal RNA. Current research has identified over 40 different types of RNA molecule within a eukaryotic cell. So it's likely that these three RNA polymerases somehow divide those roles amongst their transcription abilities. For instance, both RNA polymerase 2 and 3 transcribe regulatory RNAs such as microRNA and small interfering RNA. Molecular comparisons between the three domains of life allow us to get an insight into how things evolved. One thing for sure is that today eukaryotic RNA polymerase 2, the one that encodes most protein coding genes, contains about a dozen or so polypeptide subunits making its core. And that's very similar to the archaeal RNA polymerase, the one that it has, which has 11 or more subunits. Although not identical to eukaryotic RNA polymerase 2, there seems to be some overlap in the functionality there. Compare this to bacterial RNA polymerase, and that only has five subunits, as we saw in a previous part of chapter 8. Scientists have used various techniques available to them in the past and currently to elucidate the structure and function of RNA polymerases. So the approaches that have been used in the past for RNA polymerase 2 involved identifying promoters through mutation or by generating a consensus by studying enough genes and allowing computer programs to compare those. Additionally, other molecular biology techniques such as looking at free DNA versus DNA that's bound to proteins and studying that has allowed scientists to narrow down promoter regions. These results show a pattern. Not an absolute pattern, but they do show a pattern. The first is that just upstream of the transcription start site, there's a consensus called the Tata box, sometimes known as the goldberg hogness box after the scientists that discovered it. And this Tata box is a binding site factors. And in this case, factors means proteins. As well, 
at minus 80, there's normally a cat box, a small four nucleotide sequence. And then a little bit further out at minus 90 upstream, there's a GC rich box that has a consensus indicated here of six nucleotides, mostly Gs. A graphical representation is presented in figure 8.9, where the plus one site would correspond to where RNA polymerase would start encoding a RNA molecule. The presence of these eukaryotic promoter consensus elements suggests binding of proteins to orientate the RNA polymerase and then to get it on its way. So this will be part of the initiation complex. Unfortunately, because of the number of genes in eukaryotes that have been studied, there is a high degree of variability in the number and the location of these consensus elements. The TADA box is the most common, whereas the other two are more variable. And in some cases, they may even be missing or replaced by alternative types of arrangement. And we get a pattern sense here by looking at a few genes commonly found in eukaryotes. Look over the key at the bottom and then compare to the patterns above. Some of these have the Tata box, but not all of them. Many of them have the cat box, but not all of them. And some of them have them in different locations and repeating a different number of times. And at the bottom here, we have this weird situation where there is no Tata box or cat box, all we have are six GC boxes. Regardless, all these genes would be functional under the right conditions. Concentrating first on RNA polymerase II and its activity, it is again broken into four stages. The first stage is promoter recognition. The second stage is initiation. The third being elongation. And finally, termination. We're going to look at all four stages pertaining to this particular class of polymerase molecule. Whereas in E. coli, RNA polymerase need just sigma factor to bind to the promoter. In eukaryotes, a lot of other proteins have to be first bound to the promoter, and then RNA polymerase is called in subsequently prior to initiation of RNA transcription. These additional factors are called transcription factors, or TFs. Thus, under suitable conditions, and that's very important here, thus under suitable conditions, when the DNA is in the appropriate state and the rest of the cell has its protein allotment in a particular ratio, these transcription factors will begin to assemble at the promoter region in a particular order. The most common order that we've found is for transcription factors to do with RNA polymerase too. Students will be expected to know the order in which these transcription factors unite together. The first thing to understand is that the term TF is followed by Roman numeral 2 to indicate that this is RNA polymerase 2 associated transcription factor proteins. The second thing is, in this example, we're going to look at the Tata box as the principal location at which the assembly of these factors takes place. The sequence of events is as follows. At the Tata box itself, protein TF2D is the first to bind. Now, TF2D is a multi-subunit protein which contains on its surface a binding site for another cousin protein called Tata binding protein, TBP, very important. And the subunits of a protein called TBP associated factor, TAF. The three unite to form a transcription complex called the initial committed complex. Subsequently, uh, one unit each of TF2A, 2B, 2F join the initial committed complex. The surface then has the necessary contours to recruit RNA polymerase 2. And once that has taken place, further combining with transcription factor 2E and 2H completes the structure of something called the pre-initiation complex, or PIC. And that's very important. All these various type 2 proteins are called general transcription factors. And they are necessary for positioning the RNA polymerase in the right orientation at the right place so that it will direct 
RNA synthesis from the plus one position. Figure 811 sequentially depicts the order in which these events take place. So here we have the pre-initiation complex. The final stage, once all these transcription factors and the RNA polymerase II have bound to the promoter, is to then initiate RNA transcription. And that takes place when factor H and a couple of other proteins disassociate, thereby permitting RNA polymerase to begin transcription. Much research on various genes, such as the beta globin promoter, have revealed that mutations inside the consensus regions significantly reduce the levels of transcription, whereas those outside those regions had little or no effect. Data such as this in figure 812 illustrates that principle. So here we have the cat box. You can see that the level of transcription, relative transcription, this is 100%, has been reduced to under 50% by individual mutations within the Tata sequence. Likewise, moving over to the cat box, mutations in that for this particular gene reduce transcription even further down to almost nothing if the last couple of bases are altered. And the same kind of analysis can be performed for the GC rich box. Unlike the situation in bacteria, the binding to the upstream promoter is not enough in itself to induce transcription at the necessary levels. Other regions, either further away in either direction, upstream or downstream, also impact the level of transcription. These regions come in two flavors, two categories. These are called enhancer sequences. If they increase or help increase the level of transcription, and silencer sequences, which act in the opposite direction by reducing or eliminating the levels of transcription. Again, the location of these can be variable between different genes without a clear pattern. How is the binding of proteins to DNA elements, tens or even hundreds of thousands or millions of base pairs away from the promoter possible? Well, the students need to remember that DNA is more flexible than we give it credit. The bending of DNA can form these protein bridges, as indicated in figure 813. So this region here, the enhancer, is separate from the promoter. And it can be, as indicated by these double breaks, many, many thousands or hundreds of thousands or even millions of base pairs away. But because the DNA is flexible, this region, once it binds its activator proteins, can bend forward and interact with the contours of the factors bound to the primary upstream promoter and directly influence the rate of transcription. These protein bridges are a common rather than a seldomly used mechanism. Due to these more complicated interactions between protein factors, the level of transcription of a eukaryotic gene is under more variable control with many magnitudes of options available to that cell. Silencer sequences work their magic by binding their own factors, which somehow interfere with the pre-initiation complex formation, thus reducing or even eliminating levels of transcription for that particular gene. In addition, there's a higher level of regulation also possible beyond binding of factors. This depends on the state in which the DNA is wound around itself, called compactation. If DNA is loosely packed, then it's more accessible to these factors than DNA that's tightly packed around its chromatin structure. One can imagine a cell where at one point in time, its DNA is tightly packed, and at another point in time, the same DNA may be loosely packed. That level of control of gene expression is known as epigenetic, which actually translates to above the genome 
and that's easier to see. We'll discuss this at a later point. Turning our attention now to RNA polymerase 1 promoters, and no longer looking at RNA polymerase 2, we find that there's a lot of overlap between the genes encoded by RNA polymerase 2 versus RNA polymerase 1. As we mentioned earlier in this video, RNA polymerase 1 is responsible for transcribing genes for ribosomal RNA. The RNA polymerase 1 is recruited to these promoter sequences, which are normally upstream of the gene start sites, in a similar fashion as we just saw, by first binding transcription factors, which then call in RNA polymerase 1. This all takes place inside the nucleolus, which is a hotbed for rRNA synthesis and for the construction of ribosomal subunits. Surprisingly, these promoter regions for RNA polymerase 1 transcribed genes have a resemblance to some degree to bacterial RNA polymerase with its sigma factor. There is one region called the core element which overlaps the start site of transcription to which the RNA polymerase binds. And then there's another region upstream called the upstream control element which seems to have a role in controlling the level of initiation that takes place from the core element. Once appropriate proteins have bound to both these elements, only then will RNA polymerase find a target area to be recruited to. The protein that binds to the core element is called sigma-like factor 1, SL1. And the protein that binds to the upstream control element is called upstream binding factor 1. So when the, both of these are recruited, only then does RNA polymerase come along. And figure 1814 illustrates this nicely. So here's the more proximal promoter element, one close to the plus 1 site. And this is the more distal control element, the one that we call the upstream control element. And here are the two proteins that bind to it. SL1 will bind here, and UBF1 will bind here. And they do so as a dimer of each. And then, and only then, will they make a surface to which the RNA polymerase 1 will bind. And when that does so, you can see it's then positioned across the core element with its active site on the plus 1 transcription start site. Please take a few moments to learn the difference between bacterial transcription initiation, RNA polymerase 2 initiation, and RNA polymerase 1 initiation. We have not finished yet. We still have to deal with RNA polymerase 3 promoters. As we should know by now, these promoters are found on the genes for transfer RNAs, as well as a few other types of RNA, including one ribosomal RNA. How do they differ from the previous two? Well, they have a more weird structure. They have an internal control region inside the coding part of the gene. As depicted here, those regions are broken into two boxes, box A and box C. Box A will bind, unfortunately, transcription factor 3C, whereas box C will bind transcription factor 3A like a crossover. Once the molecular contours have been made on the surface of the DNA, only then will transcription factor 3b be recruited to their surface, and that completes the pre-initiation complex with RNA polymerase 3. And this time RNA polymerase 3 will sit upstream of the promoter complex but at the right point to begin transcription of these genes. The proceeding is just a consensus. When enough genes are studied, we do find that RNA polymerase 3 promoters, they do vary, and some genes have upstream regulatory elements that do bind and regulate the behavior of these proximal promoters. Interestingly, from an evolutionary perspective, when we study archaea and their promoters, comparisons between the three domains of life reveal that archaea and their promoters resemble 
The promoter arrangements normally found in eukaryotic polymerase type 2 genes. Indeed, these similarities extend to two protein homologs, each of which resembles either the Tata binding protein binding to a proximal upstream binding site, and a second protein known as the Tata box and transcription factor B, which binds to a more distant region called the BRE. And that's indicated here on this figure. These findings have profound implications for the history of life on this planet. These evidence, combined with much more, reveal that eukaryotes and archaea are more closely related to each other than they are to bacteria. In particular, we now know from these studies that the structure and activity of RNA polymerase in archaea is much more like that of eukaryotic RNA polymerase II than it is of the one type of our bacterial RNA polymerase. In addition, the elements of the promoter themselves seem to function and orientate themselves in eukaryotes much like those in archaea than of bacteria. The next section of the chapter begins to deal with what happens to the messenger RNA once it has been encoded from the DNA. That is known as post-transcriptional processing. The introns that we mentioned earlier that are found in nearly all eukaryotic genes, those have to be removed precisely. The separation of transcription within the nucleus and translation outside the nucleus in the cytoplasm is not seen with prokaryotes. But it does offer some advantages in that post-transcriptional modification events can be enhanced to benefit the cell. The thing to remember is that there are three major events taking place from the journey from pre-messenger RNA to mature messenger RNA. That includes adding a cap, a molecular cap, to the five primed end of the transcript, adding a tail to the three primed end of the transcript, and removing these introns, as we just mentioned. Capping is relatively straightforward compared to the other two processes. During elongation of transcription, when about 20 to 30 nucleotides of the pre-messenger RNA have been synthesized, a special enzyme, guaninal transferase, adds a backwards guanine to the 5 primed end. Other modifications, such as methylation of that newly added guanine, and other nucleotides in the vicinity may take place. The purpose is to stabilize the 5 primed end once it enters the cytosol. The addition of the guanine to the pre-messenger RNA is therefore called 5' capping. All messenger RNAs entering the cytosol from the nucleus will have a 5' cap. Other than protection, three other functions of the cap are important for us to learn. The first is that these caps allow the efficient transfer of the mature messenger RNA through the nuclear pores. The second thing is, during manufacture of the pre-messenger RNA, the cap is important in identifying the machinery for intron splicing to do its job. And then finally, out in the cytosol, the cap is important in orientating the ribosome so it captures the messenger RNA in the correct direction. Cap formation is a biochemical maneuver that students should learn. It is not that difficult. Here we have the end of a messenger RNA transcript. We have the three phosphates of the very first nucleotide present. What the capping enzyme does, it identifies the gamma phosphate, the last phosphate, and it cuts the bond right here. At the same time, the incoming backward nucleotide, the G nucleotide, also is cut, but this time 
between the alpha and the beta subunit. So the ones in purple are eliminated and this phosphate is then attached to the beta phosphate of the messenger RNA. Therefore we have this 5 to 5 triphosphate linkage and in most cases we also get subsequent methylation of the guanine as well as other bases in the vicinity of the end which are added by another enzyme called uh, methyl transferase. Polyadenylation by contrast is a much more sophisticated biochemical maneuver that is part of the termination of transcription. Unfortunately it still is not fully understood at this time. The task is performed mainly by enzymes which cut the messenger RNA at a predetermined location and replace it with a string of adenines. We need to learn these steps in a lot more detail and that's what the next four slides enable us to do. There shall be a lot of interplay between DNA sequences and protein factors. Let's first begin by looking at the arrangement of a typical pre-messenger RNA fragment produced by a RNA polymerase 2. That's indicated in a cartoon form at the very top of figure 18. At this point the 5 primed end of the pre-messenger RNA already has its cap installed. There's a small region called the 5 primed untranslated region preceding the start codon, the AUG. This will become relevant when we look at translation in a subsequent chapter. But for now, this part of the messenger RNA is not attached to by the ribosome when it's coding for protein. The coding protein region, it would be here in green. Subsequently, there's a stop codon that tells the ribosome again the subject of the next chapter, uh, tells the ribosome when to stop. After that there's a region of RNA that is not transcribed, that's called the 3 primed untranslated region. Beyond that one finds the polyadenylation signal sequence. This sequence is very important at directing the cellular machinery to add poly A tail subsequently to this location. The pre-messenger RNA continues beyond that point into a U-rich region that also plays a role in processing of this pre-messenger RNA. And eventually the RNA transcript, the pre-messenger RNA transcript ends somewhere over here at the end of the gene. What we have to learn is what happens subsequently in these four steps. If students follow a logical process this is not that difficult to master either. So here we go. Step number one. Cleavage and polyadenylation specific factor, a protein, CPSF, it binds near the polyadenylation signal sequence, which is always AAU, AAA, since it's on the pre-messenger RNA. And that is always downstream of the stop codon and we'll understand what the stop code on is in the subsequent chapter. This binding is quickly followed by the binding of cleavage stimulating factor CSTF1 to a uracil rich region just downstream of the polyadenylation signal sequence, this one up here. And then this binding of two proteins allows two further proteins CF1 and CF2, cleavage factors 1 and 2, to bind next and then finally polyadenylate polymerase PAP binds. So going back to this figure, this is what we are talking about here. The binding of these factors to this region of the DNA and this region of the DNA. That causes a hairpin to form as the factors unite this aggregation. The aggregate is able to then cut the pre-messenger RNA 10 to 30 nucleotides downstream of the polyadenylation signal sequence. 
So we see that right here. So here's the polyadenylation sequence and about 30 or so nucleotides down the pre-messenger RNA will be cleaved. This cleavage splits the pre-messenger RNA into two fragments. The former destined to become the messenger RNA and the latter will be degraded eventually after first performing a new trick. The newly created 3 primed end of the pre-messenger RNA molecule undergoes enzymatic addition of about 200 down to about 20 adenines. And this occurs through the action of CPSF and the PEP polymerase that we spoke about earlier, which recruits a helper to allow it to continue to add polyase and the helper comes in in the form of a poly A binding protein 2, PAB2. These events are shown near the bottom of figure 818. What reason would evolution have for generating these poly A tails at the 3 primed end of mature messenger RNA? Well, one of them is to enable transport across the nuclear pores into the cytoplasm. The second is to protect that end of the messenger RNA from dangerous enzymes that are present in the cytosol. Number three, to enhance translation by enabling the ribosomal recognition of messenger RNA, just like the five primed end. In addition, uh, many authors believe that the length of the poly A tail is proportional to the life expectancy of that messenger RNA in the cytosol. So the longer the tail, the more likely to survive is that messenger RNA. Incidentally, not all genes that are transcribed and translated undergo polyadenylation. It appears that histone genes are not subject to this process. Let's return to that surprise that we mentioned earlier. A more recent finding has shed light on how transcription termination in eukaryotes may take place. And it's very similar to what we saw with rho termination in bacteria, but not identical. Any enzyme that can digest a DNA is called a DNase. Any enzyme that can digest RNA is called an RNase. In this case, we're looking at digesting not the DNA, which is not touched, but the RNA. Thus, we'll be talking about this fragment here, which continues to be transcribed by RNA polymerase 2. A special kind of RNase called torpedo RNase loads itself onto the end of the pre-messenger RNA and begins to cut the nucleotides in a really rapid fashion. Eventually, it'll catch up with the RNA polymerase 2, which continues on its journey in copying the template strand. Once the torpedo RNAs arrives close to the surface of the RNA polymerase 2, the resultant interaction causes the RNA polymerase 2 to be physically pulled off the template DNA and thus terminating transcription of this particular gene. Any transcript produced from this region will be completely digested by the torpedo RNAs. Let's tackle the third process, the removal of introns through molecular splicing. This process is a little more involved than polyadenylation, but not so much so that students should not learn this. Just a reminder that exons are kept in the messenger RNA, whereas introns do not make it into the messenger RNA and are therefore removed between pre-messenger RNA and messenger RNA manufacture. To date, introns have been found in all three branches of the tree of life. They are most common in eukaryotic genes, very rare in bacterial genes, and occasionally found in archaeal genes. The molecular machine that removes introns is called the spliceosome complex. In addition, 
other types of introns can be removed by a process of self-splicing or by using a completely different enzymatic process than the spliceosome. Table 8.3 reminds students of the similarities and differences between the different mechanisms that have been discovered in natural systems. Most surprising is the list on the far column where we can see bacteria and archaea are mentioned numerous times. Only in the pre-messenger RNA row do we have the spliceosome, and that appears to be common to eukaryotic nuclear genes. Whichever mechanism a particular gene uses for splicing, the process has to be very, very, very precise because an error one way or the other in terms of one nucleotide will throw off the subsequent mechanism of translation. Experiments such as our looping were instrumental in deducing the existence of introns. In this technique, two types of nucleic acid, one the original DNA and the second is the mature RNA from the same gene are hybridized together in the remarkable molecular juggling act, the single-stranded DNA and its complementary RNA are able to base pair with each other. However, because the DNA has introns, and those introns do not exist in the mature messenger RNA, those sections of DNA will form loops and therefore loop out. So intron A has no counterpart in the messenger RNA, therefore it forms a loop. Same thing with intron B. Intron B will form a loop and the much larger intron C will also form a massive loop as can be seen right there. So these experiments exposed the difference between the longer DNA strand and the shorter mature messenger RNA strand. Now if this experiment was done using pre-messenger RNA then there would be no loops. How does the machinery of the cell know where to cut the pre-messenger RNA? And the answer is that information is encoded in the DNA and passed on to the transcript as it's being made. So in the transcript we have a junction, a boundary called the exon intron boundary. And because the intron here in yellow has two ends, we have two boundaries. So this side is called the five primed splice site. And this side is called the three primed splice site. It is at these locations that the spliceosome is designed to make those position cuts. By studying a lot of genes and their intron exon boundaries, scientists have come to a consensus. And you can see the consensus here. The most important thing is that the five prime splice site has these particular bases more common than not. And the GU is particularly conserved on this side, as is the AG on the three primed splice site. In addition, there's a third requirement. And the re third requirement is that this sequence here appear between 20 and 40 nucleotides from the three primed end with an A at the branch point. This adenine is very important. As before, mutational analysis shows the importance of these regions. And all three consensus sequences are essential for accurate splicing of any single intron. A clue to the formation of the spliceosome is given in the bottom half of the figure. A protein factor called U1 binds to the 5' splice site. A second protein called U2 binds to the branch point adenine. Three other proteins, namely U4, U5 and U6, are recruited to form a complex with U1 and U2. This is known as the inactive spliceosome. The active spliceosome is formed when U4 disassociates from the complex. The spliceosome then cuts at the 5' cleavage site, forming this looped lasso-like structure 
of the pre-messenger RNA at each intron. The included video explains this rather well, so let's play that and then we'll see where we end up. Most eukaryotic protein coding genes are interrupted by sequences that do not code for amino acids in the translated gene product. These intervening sequences are called introns. The segments that express the amino acids in the protein are called exons. When the protein coding genes are transcribed, a precursor mRNA molecule is produced. The pre-mRNA is a base-for-base -base copy of the gene, containing both exons and introns. To produce a mature mRNA, the introns in the pre-mRNA must be removed and its remaining exons must be spliced together. This process is called RNA splicing. RNA splicing depends on recognizing the boundary between exon and intron. Introns typically begin with 5' GU and end with 3' AG. However, other nucleotides at both the 5' and 3' splice junctions also play an important role in specifying the exon-intron boundaries. RNA splicing occurs in a series of steps which involve small nuclear ribonucleoprotein particles, or SNRPs. SNRPs are complexes of small RNA molecules and a number of proteins. The first step in splicing occurs when the U1 SNRP recognizes the 5' splice junction between exon 1 and intron 1. U1 attaches to the GU at the 5' end of the intron. If a mutation alters one of these bases, splicing at this junction is blocked and the intron is not removed. In addition to the 5' GU and 3' AG intron sequence, there is also the branch point sequence that is important for RNA splicing. The branch point sequence consists of seven nucleotides located near the 3' AG splice site. In mammals, this sequence is YNCURAY, where Y is a pyrimidine, N is any base, and R is a purine. U1 attachment at the 5' GU leads the way to the binding of the U2 SNRP. The U2 attaches to the final adenine of the branch point sequence. A trimer forms between the U4, U5, and U6 SNRPs. This trimer associates with both U1 and U2, bringing them closer together. This causes the intron to loop. After U1 and U2 are brought together, U4 is released. This release results in the formation of an active spliceosome, whose function is to remove the intron from between the two flanking exons. Cleavage first occurs at the 5' GU, separating intron 1 from exon 1. The 5' guanine covalently bonds to the final adenine, located in the branch point sequence. This looped structure is called a lariat. Cleavage then occurs at the junction between 3' AG and exon 2. Exon 1 and exon 2 are ligated together in a 5' 3' phosphodiester bond with the release of the intron. U1, U2, U5, and U6 remain attached to the intron lariat and carry it to debranching enzymes located in the nucleus. The enzymes degrade the RNA and recycle the nucleotides. This process is repeated for each intron. When all introns have been removed, a mature mRNA is produced. Now the mRNA is ready to exit the nucleus and be translated by cytoplasmic ribosomes. Nice. A fascinating observation was that introns are not removed in the order in which they appear along the pre-messenger RNA transcript. They are removed, however, in a order that's predetermined for that particular gene. Another surprising investigational finding was that the tail of the RNA polymerase II itself hangs behind the enzyme. So the carboxyl terminal domain, the CDT, is a very important location that can be phosphorylated and methylated to different degrees. Thus, the application of the term gene expression machine will become appropriately relevant to you shortly. During the recognition of the promoter and initiation of RNA polymerase II,
transcription. General transcription factors, as well as other proteins, are built up on the tail of the RNA polymerase. These include the majority of the protein factors that we spoke about during initiation of DNA transcription, as well as the enzymes for 5' capping, those involved in splice factor binding, and of course polyadenylation, including the torpedo RNAs that we mentioned previously. As soon as initiation of transcription begins, the pre-initiation complex falls off, allowing the polymerase to begin synthesizing for the first time the pre-messenger RNA. Now riding on the tail, we have the capping proteins. As soon as a small segment of pre-messenger RNA materializes for the first time, uh, the proteins recognize the end and apply the cap immediately. Once the cap is applied, those enzymes are no longer needed and they are discarded by the tail of the RNA polymerase. Subsequently, as more and more pre-messenger RNA is made, introns are recognized and the introns are then removed by the presence of other proteins which recruit to the site the spliceosomes, the U proteins. Subsequently, when the polyadenylation signal is manufactured, those proteins are able to cleave the pre-messenger RNA at the appropriate site, and the remaining message is degraded by the torpedo RNAs, which follows rapidly the RNA polymerase II. Termination takes place and the finished messenger RNA is exported through nuclear pores to the cytosol. The discovery of introns was made when we had a conundrum. The conundrum was that the human cells are able to produce over 100,000 distinct proteins between the various cell types. But the Human Genome Project revealed that the number of genes that the human genome contains is in the order of about 22,500. So it's impossible to marry the two numbers together if there's a one gene to one polypeptide. Thus, the only mechanism able to explain this disparity is a pattern of alternative splicing. So genes can be spliced in different tissues or in different time periods in the same tissue according to the conditions that exist inside that cell at that time. At this point in time, three transcription associated mechanisms are known to explain alternative patterns of splicing. Quite logically, they have to do with the beginning, the middle and the end of a messenger RNA. So let's start at the beginning one can have alternative promoters. So rather than starting at the plus one site every time in different cell types, you may start at a position either upstream or downstream of what normally was recognized as the start site. So these are alternative promoters. The second is at the end of the gene. Uh, you can have different locations, i.e. more than one polyadenylation signal that exists on a particular gene. And by using the alternative locations, you can produce alternative lengths of pre-messenger RNA and then essentially uh, messenger RNA. And of course, you can alternatively splice. That means you can use different patterns of removing introns and exons along a particular gene, therefore producing alternative transcripts. Let's look at each one in turn. If one compares a gene, say, in brain cells and kidney cells, you may find that the same gene produces alternative types of protein in these two tissues. The same gene produces alternative types of protein in the two tissues. Upon closer examination, it's seen that alternative intron splicing takes place in brain cells as compared to kidney cells. Thus, both cell types produce the same pre-messenger RNA. However, by the time you produce mature messenger RNA, it's different 
in each of these two cell types. Incidentally, computer software tells us that 70% of human genes are thought to undergo alternative splicing, and therefore we can reach that 100,000 different types of polypeptide. Another observation is that other animals, other than humans and primates, they have alternative splicing to a lower degree. And in fact, it's very rare to find this in our plant populations. The textbook uses the calcitonin example to illustrate this. Calcitonin gene exists in every cell in the body that has DNA. Two locations express this gene. The first is thyroid cells in your neck, and the second location are neurons in the brain of your central nervous system. Both activate the same gene. However, in thyroid cells, calcitonin is produced as a hormone, and it only contains parts of that gene. In neurons, an alternative, CGRP, which is known as calcitonin, gene-related peptide is produced, and it has a different function than calcitonin. The gene itself contains six exons, and they are two alternative polyadenylation sites. One is in exon 4, and the other one is after exon 6. In thyroid cells, which produce the truncated form of the protein calcitonin, they use the exon 4 polyadenylation site, whereas neuron cells skip this and use the exon 6 polyadenylation site. And that's indicated right here in this figure and down here in the bottom half of the same figure. So the result is from the same gene you get two different polypeptides because of alternative splicing. The mechanism underlying all three types of processing is the same. One has to understand that brain cells are not the same thing as thyroid cells. They are different. Therefore, they will have different combinations and different ratios of proteins in the nucleus already. And the way that they interact with the DNA will be different. That makes sense. And this difference is what drives alternative splicing. If you took all the proteins out of a brain cell and put them in the thyroid cell, well, the first thing is it'll become a brain cell. But the second thing is that it will then adopt the type of splicing that you see in a brain cell because now all the proteins are present in that combination and no longer in the combination of a thyroid cell. So location and what's inside that location is very important in driving alternative splicing or the use of alternative promoters or the use of alternative polyadenylation. Some amazing examples of alternative splicing are indicated on this slide in the case of the rat alpha tropomyosin gene. Tropomyosin is normally a protein produced by muscle cells and fibroblasts to allow locomotion. So here we have the gene itself and it's divided into multiple exons and the different exons are alternatively spliced in different tissue. But not only that, the gene also contains five alternative polyadenylation sites as well as two promoter sites. And in the case of the rat, this results in nine different types of messenger RNA produced in different cell types. Let's take a quick look at self-splicing introns. Spouse, uh, these RNA molecules do not need the help of proteins. They are able to perform the functions themselves. Something that is called a RNA enzyme or ribozyme. So ribozymes, we believe, were some of the first molecules on the planet. Maybe in the first life forms that relied on RNA to do everything, store information and perform biochemical functions. But regardless, uh, we do find within living systems today examples of self-splicing introns. The ones that use ribozymes are known as group 1 self-splicing introns. There's another group called group 2 which do not rely on ribozymes. If one looks very carefully 
in the functioning of group one self-splicing introns, there's a very similar nature to the way that we have the spliceosome work. We have attacking nucleotides that bridge a gap, causing cleavage and transfer of chemical groups from one area to another. So maybe these were the precursors of the spliceosome. Group two introns are not much different to group one. The only difference being that they are found in archaea, bacteria, but not in nuclear genes. They are found in mitochondrial and chloroplast genes of eukaryotes. Once again, the lariat-like structure is employed, but it's a little bit more complex than group one. Ribosomal RNA genes are processed in a manner that sort of overlaps what we just talked about, except that large precursor RNAs are transcribed first, which are then cut into smaller molecules to remove something known as spacer sequences, which is akin to what we just spoke about in a more roundabout type of way. These RNAs do not need to be sent, in the case of eukaryotes, to the cytosol. They remain in the nucleus and take up a secondary structure allowing them to function. Or they may join ribosomal proteins to form the ribosome subunits directly. Some chemical modifications of these RNAs after transcription is complete, takes place, and that would include methylation and to some degrees a small amount of phosphorylation. In this E. coli example, we have an RNA coding gene which seems to be carrying the information for making both ribosomal RNA and tRNA at the same time. By performing different types of cleavage, the alternative forms of RNA are released and each one is then able to function in its final form. In humans we have a similar situation, although not identical, but similar enough to tell us that this process may be very ancient in allowing a gene to code for multiple RNA entities. Ribosomal RNA processing may be similar in prokaryotes and eukaryotes, but when it comes to tRNA processing, uh, there is a major difference between the two groups. All tRNAs have similar structure and function. It doesn't matter where they come from. As we saw in the example above, some tRNAs are produced along with ribosomal RNAs in bacteria. Others are produced from dedicated genes that where they produce a large pre-tRNA transcript that's then cleaved into individual tRNA molecules. This is, however, not observed in any eukaryotes where each tRNA gene produces a single tRNA molecule. Figure 828 shows a typical two-dimensional view of a tRNA molecule, as well as a more folded three-dimensional view of the same molecule. And we can see the anticodon is on the south side. There are some double-stranded RNA regions with hairpin loops and then we have the then we have the attachment site for the amino acid and these three bases CCA can be added subsequently after the RNA has been manufactured from its gene. The number of tRNAs that a particular organism or organelle makes is different uh, we do know that there are 61 different codons coding for amino acids. Some of them are overlapping. So how many tRNAs does a cell need? And the answer is the minimum it needs is 20, one for each of the amino acids. Some eukaryotic genomes do code for 61 tRNA molecules. Others, much less. This and the following slide indicate to us the process by which bacterial tRNA processing uh, takes place. So many tRNAs are cleaved from their large precursor tRNA transcripts to produce individual tRNA molecules. The nucleotides are trimmed from both ends of these molecules and certain individual nucleotides can be chemically modified. T 
tRNAs fold into a precise three-dimensional structure, including the regions that we just described. And then the tRNA can undergo post-transcriptional additional bases, as indicated. The situation is very similar in eukaryotes and archaea. However, research shows that eukaryotic pre-tRNAs may also include small introns that are removed. The relationship between the information encoded in the DNA and what appears in the messenger RNA may not be exactly what we imagine. Some genes undergo something called RNA editing. That is, once the transcript has been manufactured from the DNA, the nucleotide bases can be modified, added, or deleted. In the example given on this slide, we can see that a guide RNA directs RNA editing. With this example, the production of the messenger RNA as well as the production of a guide RNA causes the two to hybridize with each other. Once hybridized, the guide RNA untangles and introduces into the messenger RNA additional nucleotides that the messenger RNA did not have initially. And this is a pretty complex process, but it uses RNA polymerase uh, to manufacture the new bases that are then inserted into the messenger RNA. The guide RNA is then recycled and the messenger RNA is then utilized in its fi final capacity. Some scientists conjecture that this process may allow a cell to rapidly evolve through environmental challenges, even though the word evolve should not be used since the DNA itself is not changing. An alternative mechanism has also been discovered known as base substitution. Epolipoprotein B is produced by human liver as well as intestinal cells. Base substitution of the messenger RNA, once it's fully formed in intestinal cells, causes a premature stop codon to be generated. This results in a truncated protein which is present in intestinal cells compared to the normal length in liver cells. We're pretty sure that there are more secrets out there that nature has utilized, either hidden in plain sight or waiting to be discovered in some unusual locations. Regardless, this chapter has given us a great insight into the simple process of transcription.